Happy Thanksgiving to you. Really appreciate uh, this congregation. I, I have a couple of stories to tell you before the mess, before I pray and get into the message. Um, our house sold on Thursday. Gwen is so excited that she's got laryngitis today. <laughs> And we have a number of houses to look at today and a couple this week possibly, so uh, our house, we've got to be out of our house by the 26th of October. And uh, so uh, any spare rooms you might have, <laughs> we, we just might need something. Uh, but God supplied and we're just very thankful. For One of the houses we were looking at was up on Northland's Crescent. And... Um, so we were looking, I was, I had it on my list to see today, and then um, my uh, landlord, where I'm currently uh, <laughs> residing, said, I think one of the elders of our church just bought that house. <laughs> so in order to keep the unity of the bond of peace within the congregation, uh, you know, uh, Dave and his wife and family have that house, so he sold his first. So that would be like that. So I'm not very happy for them that they have a place to live and that your pastor is still at no fixed address. <laughs> so anyway, I, I had a, I, I kind of stopped in at the wedding yesterday and I saw two little ring bearers come in and just start crying. They were beautiful little guys in their tuxes. And uh, it was a nice wedding and, and then uh, uh, Hubert also lost his brother this past week, and there was a funeral yesterday, and then our church helped out here, just giving them a spot for family to gather after. So I'm just very thankful to our congregation for just uh, the way we minister to one another and bless one another. And that goes right alongside uh, this message today out of Nehemiah chapter 5. You turn there, you've got notes there to fill in as well. And uh, Dylan's looking after PowerPoint this morning. We're going to get over to a great passage of Scripture. It's kind of tough at the beginning, so bear with me, okay? And uh, But the applications are huge for us as uh, we work through this together. So let me pray. Father, we um, just thank you for your grace and your goodness uh, to us. We... we have to be a grateful people. When we know you, Lord Jesus, and you have planted your Holy Spirit in our life, we see, Heavenly Father, how your plan works out in our life. We thank you this week for Lisa coming into the family of God. We thank you for her, Father. May we bless her. May we just encourage her in her faith. There are others too, Father, that we've been praying for, that they would come to know you too and be part of your eternal family. All of us who know you today have friends and family, co-workers that we just uh, we have a burden for. It. Lord, you put that burden in our life. So, Father, give us words and actions that just show the love of Jesus. We pray. And as we look at this uh, incredible passage of Scripture, we just pray that you bless our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Don and I have been blessed at being in the same house together. We have had someone who brings us fresh muffins and cookies every once in a while. But this week, we almost had a falling out. Mainly because I took the last raisin oatmeal. <laughs> now fortunately, while I was home, my mother sent back with me some apple pie, two pieces, one for Don and one for me. But I gave up my piece of pie in order to keep the peace because of the outcry that I ate the last cookie. <laughs> we got to be thankful for little things, don't we? We are all blessed in so many ways, whether it's cookies, whether it's clothing, whether it's shelter. Um, Justin and I were having a conversation the other day about what, it, what is Thanksgiving all about? And we talked about some of the scriptures and just having a grateful heart to the Lord and what that means. But as 
I have been kind of walking through Nehemiah chapter 5, I kind of come to some conclusions. It, it's great for us to have a, an attitude of thanksgiving. Uh, it's great for us to give thanks for all that God has done and for all the bounty that we experience. But there's something more because when we're truly grateful, different things are to happen in our life. If you turn to Nehemiah chapter 5, uh, there is some very powerful verses here. Nehemiah is dealing once again with another problem. You might call this the problem within the walls of Jerusalem. Remember last week they were kind of half done and the people are still working away at it and then another problem pops up. Anytime there's a pro project or something that has to get done, do you ever realize that about halfway through, I mean that's when kind of problems start. Right? And so Nehemiah and the people of God, there's no difference. So go to verse 1 with me. It says, Now the men, and notice this, and their wives raised a great outcry against their Jewish brothers. This was not about cookies. This was not about pie. This was not about just kind of ordinary things. You will see why they have this great outcry. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields and our vineyards and our homes to get the grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our countrymen, and though our sons are as good as theirs, yet we have had to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. When I heard the other problem, this is me and mine, and these charges I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind, and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you are exacting usury from your own countrymen. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have brought back our Jewish, we have bought back our Jewish brothers who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you're selling your brothers only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. So I continued, what are you doing? What you're doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the approach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain, but let the exacting of usury stop. Give back to them immediately their fields, their vineyards, their olive groves and houses, and also the usury you are charging them, the hundred part of the money, grain, new wine, and oil. And then notice the response. We will give it back, they said. And we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. Nehemiah is dealing with another problem. But this is not a new problem. Uh, I've uh, had the opportunity to meet with some people that have authority and responsibility within the county of Oxford. Uh, I have been introduced because of people within this church who know people. And I'm getting to know what Oxford County is all about. Uh, you might say I've been kind of surveying it, hearing the needs, hearing some stories. And one of the stories that I heard was about uh, a man who was helping out with some needs last Christmas here in Oxford County. And uh, there was a little boy who was asked what he wanted for Christmas. And this is what he said. He said, all I want this Christmas is some new socks, some new shirts, and some underwear. And that's in our yeah. I'll tell you a little bit more about that story a little bit later. Throughout Nehemiah, we see Nehemiah just, as God has revealed different things to him, he and those who are on his team are solving problems together. And uh, one of the things that each of us has an opportunity to do is, as we are grateful, God might show us different things that we need to do in order for us uh, to help those around us that, that are poor, that are broken. Nehemiah saw these things. These things were happening inside the walls, you might say. 
Uh, they were not happening outside. They were happening within the people of God. And Nehemiah discovers it because there's an outcry. There's a famine going on. There's a whole number of things going on all at the same time. You might say that he had this kind of layers of problems that he, as the new governor, had to deal with. We saw clearly that he didn't, uh, he didn't take advantage of that. Uh, he was just a leader who was serving and helping to solve the issue. So the struggle is very clear, uh, first of all, in verses 1 to 5. It says, first of all, that the people are starving, right? This is the struggle that's going on in verses 1 to 5. Here's the problem. The people are starving. The men and their wives raised a, a great outcry. And some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. Uh, God was blessing them as families. But they, they, in order to stay alive, they had to get grain. And so some of them were mortgaging their fields. They were selling what they had in order to, to do that. And as a result, the second problem was happening amongst them. They were broke. There was uh, not enough uh, money at the end of the month, you might say. And they were saying, we're mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, our homes to get grain during the famine. And, and this group, they had a way to get food, but it was not a good situation as they were participating in the building of the wall. They're also warring against the value of their farmland, their vineyards, and their homes to survive. And we all know how a hope, what a hopeless position that would be. They're basically living by a credit card. And then we also see their abuse. Verses 4 to 5. A large, and, and it's a very large and complicated uh, complaint. Still others were saying, we had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. They had tax back then too. Don't you just love tax? And though they were of the same flesh and blood as their countrymen, their sons, as they say, are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards now belong to others. We are not even getting the harvest ourselves from the work we've done. So there were taxes. There was slavery. There was property ownership. There was no way out for them in, in so many ways. They, there was issues of human trafficking. That's what was going on. Selling their own sons and daughters in order to survive. And then Jewish people would then sell those people into the extended community. You've got to understand what a heartbreaker. There was emotional abuse. There was physical abuse. No doubt there was going to be sexual abuse. And there was going to be religious abuse. Because some of these people said, we were, do we're doing it in the name of God. But Nehemiah hears their cries. And he stands up. He, he stands up against the injustices that are going on in the society. And going on amongst his own people, within the walls of the, the, the community, God's community at that time. And he brings good news, but he has to stand up first. The response is in verses 6 to 11. Uh, this is an important response. Uh, I think he, he must have you know, heard from the people the outcry of the men and women and what was going on. And, Maybe he said like Jesus in, in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And there are times in our own lives where we have maybe been emotionally abused, physically abused, or gone through some sort of abuse or even religious abuse where at times we have to just have to say, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. But Nehemiah does something. See, real leaders do not cause more problems. They solve them. Okay, that's one of my famous quotes. Okay? Um, and I love that. I learned it from the leaders that I've had in my life. They modeled it for me. Real leaders do not cause problems. They solve them. Okay? Real leaders just don't talk about problems. They don't do the political thing. They don't talk about problems. They take action with others to get it done, as we saw in Nehemiah chapter 2. But notice something 
here. Nehemiah wants to understand, and he becomes angry. He ponders. He listens to them. When I heard their outcry and these charges, what does it say about Nehemiah? What does he do? Does he just let it go because he's the governor? He wants to be politically correct? No, he says, I'm angry. I was very angry. This is real righteous anger that Nehemiah has because of the injustices that are happening amongst his people within the wall. Within the wall. He's not worried about the pagan people that are out there. He's worried about the people right now within the walls of God's community. He's angry because there are people taking advantage of poor brothers and sisters. Where did we get the idea that all anger is bad? Anger can be bad, that's for sure. But Ephesians 4.26 says, In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down, down while you're still angry. Nehemiah doesn't keep brewing on the anger. Doesn't keep kind of uh, you know letting it brew till he explodes. He finally just deals with it. Jesus was angry and didn't sin. He chased away the, the money changers from the temple on more than one occasion, but didn't sin. He was angry at his disciples were, were that that his disciples were telling people or telling parents to keep their children away from him, but he didn't sin. He was angry that the Pharisees made it very difficult for people to come to God. These Pharisees, these Sadducees that Jesus was dealing with all the time, the religious leaders, they were religious abusers. And they made it very difficult for people to come to God because they based their relationship on God on keeping the rules, not a relationship. Jesus' anger was at the injustices done to other people. Let's be honest. Most of our anger that we have is just selfish. You made me feel bad. You made me look bad. You inconvenienced me. You slighted me. You blocked my personal will. Righteous anger is being angry at the things that grieves the heart of God. Not the things that bug me. There's a big difference. I, I kind of thought about that and thought about the times I've been angry lately. I go, it's been about my circumstance, my house, not selling. Why didn't that person buy it? They're stupid. That's a great house up in Ottawa. I just want to get out of Ottawa. I mean, you know, you know, I'm, I'm going through all this stuff. I want my family together. I've sometimes got mad at God about it. And I had to get that cleared up. Because his timetable, my timetable, totally different deal. Why did Dave Armstrong have to buy that? I was up in the You know, you can get angry quickly about a lot of stupid stuff, right? And it takes away from your life. Real leaders don't cause more problems, they solve them. And I mean, Nehemiah takes time to understand and he gets angry about the right things. He's angry that families are being torn apart. He's angry that people are being sold into slavery. There's human trafficking going on amongst his own people. That's how bad it goes. So what does he say? He says, stop mistreating the poor. In these next verses. You're taking advantage of the fact that these are difficult days. And, 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 and food is scarce, money is tight. And so these, there were certain people who had money that they were just adding to their portfolio. They were buying up cheap land. They were just having a great old time taking advantage of the plight of the poor, buying up their land for pennies on the dollar at that time. And actually when they bought the land, they also got what? They got the harvest that was there. So those people were even more hungry. He tells them, stop being a bad example. You are the people of God. You're making the heathen people around us gracious. Because the heathen people realize that as they're buying these Jewish people, sons and daughters, they were 
they had some conscience about it, gave them some work, but then they were trying to sell pe those people back to their own families because they could sense the stress and the abuse that was going on because of what was going on. So he says, stop being a bad example. Bless the poor. Have a good example. Don't take advantage of what is going on here. Stop the evil practices that you are, are producing because you just want personal gain. You are unfair, he says, in your lending. They were, he was charging, they were charging usury. It was abusive, it was unfair interest, and, uh, and the practice had to stop amongst God's people. Uh, Nehemiah, no doubt, would have quoted maybe Exodus 22-25, if you lend money to one of my people among you who is needy, do not treat it like a business deal. Charge no interest. He's basically, oh, that verse basically says, just give it to them. If they pay it back, great. But if you have abundance and you can help somebody else out, just do it. That verse assumes that people understand that whatever they have is from the hand of God, not from their own hand. In our society today, I think there's a lot of people that believe that this is mine, my stuff. No, it's not. It says in Deuteronomy that God gives you the ability to produce wealth. Did you know that? God gives you the ability to produce wealth. So anything that you have from your work, any results from that, that's from the hand of God. Not from your own hands. Because God can stop the ability that you have. He can change things up very quickly. I mean, Leviticus 25, 35 to 42 says, if any of your fellow Israelites become poor and are, able and are unable to support themselves among you, help them as you would a foreigner and a stranger so they can continue, notice this, to live among you. Do not take interest or any profit from them, but fear your God, so that they may continue to live among you. You must not lend money at interest or sell them food at a profit. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. If any of you of your fellow Israelites become poor and sell themselves to you, do not make them work as slaves. They are to be treated as hired workers or temporary residents among you. They are to work for you until the year of Jubilee. That's when they, their freedom could be given. Then they and their children are to be released, and they will go back to their own clans, to the property of their ancestors, because the Israelites are, notice this, what God says, are my servants, whom I brought out of Egypt. They must not be sold as slaves to one another. When you look at that and see what was happening, no wonder Nehemiah was angry. And I think, I saw this quote the other day, I don't know who said it, but it says, people only have a hard time hearing the truth if they have something to hide. That, that, that just kind of hit me hard. Because though Nehemiah was the governor, and he had authority, those people could have just said, well, Nehemiah, this is just the way it is in town right now. We've got to make some extra money, or whatever. But instead, they heard from him. He had such spiritual credibility amongst the people that he brought them to the solution, verses, which is verses 12 and 18. He basically calls them to repent. He said, they, they will give it back, they said. Then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and the officials take an oath to do what they had promised. See, the problem wasn't with the regular people. The problem was with the leaders and the officials who were overseeing the, the, the government of the time. They were taking advantage. And so, Nehemiah brings the priests in and makes them all... Uh, take a note. Verse 13 says, I also shook out the robe, the folds of my robe, and said, In this way may God shake out of his house and, and possessions every man who does not keep this promise. So may such a man be shaken out and empty. 
Now, I just love Nehemiah. He's not one of these kind of, he's not pussyfooting around. He takes the, his, his garment and he just kind of goes, and one of the nobles or one of the officials is going, why are you doing that? Nehemiah, he says, if you guys don't keep the promise, if you don't make it right with the people around you, I am praying, I am praying that God shakes you out. Isn't that great? King David used to pray prayers like that too. Lord, my enemies are increasing. They're, you know, they're doing great and I am doing a hard time, you might say. And he says, Lord, get it. God does. It might take a while, but the enemies of God always lose. But the people of God win. And he calls them to repent. He calls them to restore. And he calls them to restitution. He says, if you've wronged a brother, taken advantage of them, you pay them back. You get it right. It's so important that you do. Because basically Nehemiah is saying, God has given you the ability to produce wealth, to work, to use your hands, to receive, and, and so that you can bless others, not cheat others in any way. To be generous. Or as Nehemiah says, follow my example, as I follow the example of the Lord. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 11. I love Proverbs 11.25. It says a generous person will what? Prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. So Nehemiah and his brothers and his team, you know what they're doing? They're refreshing people. They hear about a family who had to sell their children, their young people. They go and buy them back. And they walk them back home. Can you imagine that scene? Can you imagine that scene? Nehemiah and his brothers are bringing a whole bunch of kids home. They're bringing them home. Bringing them home. That's all they're doing is just bringing them home. Right? And they're walking down the street. And they have these kids behind them who were sold into slavery. And they're coming up to the place where their parents are. And could you think, what would that look like? And Nehemiah walks to the door with his friends and others who, who catch the vision just to bless people. Take them out of poverty. Take them out of difficulty. And their parents are what are you doing here? Well, Mom, Dad, you had to sell us. And Nehemiah, his brothers, and these other guys, they just came and bought us back today. So we can come home and work with you. You talk about refreshing. There were tears of joy, people dancing around. People yelling, screaming for the right things, right? Rather than screaming because people were torn away from you. <coughs> and Nehemiah is like that. They're generous, and he just ministers to the poor and to the broken. <coughs> you see, that's the heart of a grateful person. They minister to the poor and the broken. Notice what he says here. Um, he says in the, the second half of verse 15, but out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. You know what often happens in our society? Everybody starts acting a certain way. And you know, it's kind of it's kind of a group think thing. We treat poor people badly, so we'll just keep treating poor people badly. It's their own fault. We have these kind of phrases that we throw out, right? That's their own fault. Why doesn't he have a job? The question is, why don't you give him a job? That's a great question. And, and he says, instead I devoted myself to the work on the wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. This is a very important thing. Nehemiah could have, because he was getting paid by the king, in his position with the king as the king's kind of palace manager, he could have come and, and, and demanded, he could have double dipped, let's just say. Because he, he could have said, well, you know, they, the, 
The king made me the governor as well, so that means I could get the governor, governor's salary and allotment as well. Do we ever hear about that kind of stuff going on? <coughs> Not in mind. He fears God. And notice what he says here. He says in the, the last part of verse 18, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor because that the demands were heavy on these people. You know, in verse 18, he just fed people, it says. It, it, it's incredible. 150 people and officials ate at my table every day. So he said. Every day. Can you imagine that Thanksgiving dinner? Right? He just blessing people. He ministered to the poor and the broken. Uh, I, I can tell a person who's a, truly anointed by the Spirit of God. And Jesus lays it out for us very quickly. See, the poor and the broken doesn't mean that it's just the poor that we think of have no shoes and need clothing. I've met a, a lot of up and outers too. Not just down and outers. Up and are very interesting. They have all the trappings of everything in our society, but usually they're heavily in debt. Or they're poor in spirit. Or they're broken because their families are wrecked. So all of us without Christ are poor and broken. Okay? These officials that Nehemiah was dealing with, they're poor and broken. They're poor and broken. They have the wrong attitude about life. They're not blessing anybody else around them. But I can tell someone who is truly full and anointed by the Spirit of God. How can you tell? What does Jesus say in Luke 4, 18 and 19? He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and to recover the sight for the blind, and to set the oppressed free. Huh. Not a great verse. Now Jesus fulfills that prophecy. But Jesus also gives us authority to fulfill those scriptures too. Did you know that? Because He has called us and if we're truly grateful, not just in attitude, not just in our words, and, and maybe if we took time this morning and we just kind of popcorn some answers, what are you grateful for? There would be certain themes that come up, our family or different people, or I mean, you might even be thankful, I'm not in my family this weekend. Right? Because there's stuff going on. But God's grateful people give generously to resolve the struggles of the poor and the broken. That's the lesson of Nehemiah chapter 5. It's taken a little while to get there this morning, I'm sorry. But God's grateful people give generously to resolve the struggles of the poor and the broken. Whether they are up and outers, whether they are down and outers, it doesn't really matter because those who are truly anointed by the Spirit of God and have been transformed by Jesus Christ are those who look at Look at the poor in spirit or the broken because they've been broken by life. They might have so much of what the world offers and yet they are lost. You see this all the time in the entertainment world. So back to finish about that little boy in the story from Oxford County. There was a business in his community that decided that they would ask the local school for four or five families that they could bless. And they put up a Christmas tree in the business. And as people came in, they, they got the needs of each child in those families. And this boy was in one of those families that needed shirts, socks, and underwear. Now he got that. But one of the people that's delivered shirts and socks and underwear to put under the Christmas tree for this family went to his teacher and asked, asked her what else he needed and she said well he walks a long way into school he could use a bike so 
until that person bought the bike. The bike was there. And someone else brought a helmet in, someone else brought a bell in, someone else brought a bike in. And then they, someone else found out about his brother's brother and sister, I think. Because they, all they just wanted were the basic things. And so one of my new friends in Oxford County told me that story, and he was the one who delivered those things to that family. That little boy wasn't asking for a new iPad. He was just looking for the basics. When you look at verse 19 of this passage, Nehemiah says, Remember me with favor, O my God, for all I have done for these people. You know, centuries later, we're talking about Nehemiah. Isn't that interesting? Lord, remember me? What I did for these people. There's lots of story behind Nehemiah in this deal. Lots of story. It, he, he comes and he solves some problems. He encourages the people to act like God's people. Not to act like the world. Not to make excuses, but just to bless. I mean, as I was reading verse 19, I thought... Lord, how will I be remembered? Will I be remembered as one of God's grateful people, helping the poor and the broken, no matter where they are in the scope of society? What, what will I be remembered for? Will I be remembered, my family be remembered as a family that blesses others? Will I be remembered as a person who just blesses individuals who are down and broken and need help? Will I be remembered as a person that are that mentors and coaches others up, not presses other people down? Will I be a person like so many of you who just have blessed a compassion child or a world vision child in just practical ways to lift them up? Did you know that, that in the last 20 years we've reduced the poorest of the poor from about 30% of the world's population down to 9%. you know why? Because people have started to move and help people who just need socks and underwear and shirts. And the World Bank believes that that's going to drop to 6% within the next 18 months because of what's happening in our world. Because people are just blessing and helping those who need a hand up. So, I asked myself that question. And I've responded in some way. So my question is to you, how will you be remembered? As one of God's grateful people, helping the poor and the broken? See, we need to pray for opportunities within our community. To reconcile, to care for those who are broken. And even the poor in spirit who are going through this. When I get, came back from a meeting downtown this week, I got to meet Lisa on the corner up here. She was so excited. Because that was the day after she prayed with Jason. And she just said to me, Pastor Robert, did you hear what happened to me yesterday? And I said, well, I'm coming again, but I'd rather hear from you. So she tells me the story. You know how she got into the church? There were people who went from church on Sunday outside and they were on the sidewalk. And she said to me, on my first time meeting a bunch of people, they were coming out of the church and they were happy. And I said, she said, I haven't met some of those people. She met some of those people. She met Pastor Jason. She's been meeting a lot of people. And then she surrendered her life to Christ with Pastor Jason. Because some people got out of the church and didn't kind of cluster in their own deal with their own friends. They saw her walking her little dog. Right? And just said hello. And sometimes just saying hello is the only thing that God wants us to do. In a very impersonal, 
drive in your driveway, drive into the garage, close the garage, and don't come out again to you need to the world. Because I, all of me needs sometimes is just that. Sometimes, I think we as Christians got to get a little bit angry about some things that are happening to you. But there's something positive about it. I'm tired of hanging out with Christians. And I haven't been hanging out with a lot of them here yet. I'm sure there are some in Oxford County that basically just are mad at the world. Mad at our government. Mad at this. Mad at that. But you know what? Godly people make a difference in the lives of the poor of the world. They pray, ponder, take action, and make a difference. And that's what God wants us to do here at this church more than ever. We see injustices within our own family of God. We, we need to help each other out. Because the last verse and it just comes to my mind right now. It says in Galatians 6, 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. Galatians 6. Verse 9 says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So keep doing the good that God wants you to do. Because it shows that you're a grateful person. And you're God's child. Let's pray. Father, you love us so much. We're overwhelmed at times with your grateful, the, the way in which you bless us. We who know Christ, our lives have been transformed. And because our lives have been transformed, our gratefulness has to come out in just blessing one another in the body of Christ and blessing those who are outside the body of Christ and who need to come in to your eternal family. I pray today, Father, that we would read through the, the questions that are in our notes today. Pray for those opportunities. Maybe there's someone you've laid on our heart today that this week we can bless. In just a very practical way. I, I just pray, Father, that we would not be a people that just tolerates the injustices around us, but that we would be people who are anointed with your good news to just bless and set free the prisoners and those who are oppressed and bring your healing refreshment by your spirit into the lives of others around us. So we pray, Father, that as we respond today, that we would be those kind of grateful people who are just blessing and loving the poor and the broken with the love of Jesus.